Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is great to be with you all this morning. And those of you joining us on Facebook Live, it is great to be with you as well. Um, some announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, it is December 3rd, the first Sunday of December. So that means today is communion. Uh, so if you don't have your communion stuff, if you're here, we have it in the back um, for you. And you can grab that. And those of you joining us on Facebook Live, again, want to just encourage you to grab a cracker and some juice or bread and some water, anything to celebrate communion with us. Um, so a few things uh, to share. Um, just once again, a reminder that our Sunday school class is meeting at 945 in the back corner classroom. And we're doing a study entitled Unshakable Hope with the video portion led by Max Lucado. Um, there is no prayer meeting this Wednesday, December 6th. You can certainly be in prayer, uh, but we will not have the uh, formal or official prayer meeting here in my office this Wednesday. Uh, there is men's Bible study this Friday, December 8th from 8 to 9 a.m. at Joe DeLeon's home. Um, also, just a reminder that on Thursday nights at Springs of Hope Church is a Awana's for preschool through junior high students. And Thursday nights here at the church is high school youth group. And that those both meet from 5.30 to 7.30 in the evening. Um, next Saturday, December 9th, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has invited everyone, uh, including us, to join them for their community Christmas caroling. And so uh, if you want to come for that, Meet at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, which is right next door to us here, um, at 445 to go caroling, and then return back to the church at 6.30 p.m. to enjoy dinner together. Um, and mark your calendars. We, as a church, will be going Christmas caroling on Sunday, December 17th. That is just two weeks from now. Um, and so we will meet here at 4 o'clock and go Christmas caroling as a church. And then the current plan is after Christmas caroling that we will uh, all gather together at Kathy Scully's house uh, for um, enjoyment of treats and fellowship. And so we'll let you know, but everyone bring a treat to share for that and come join us for the Christmas caroling. And then one week after that, Sunday, December 24th, we have regular Sunday school and regular church service in the morning. And then that evening, because it is Christmas Eve, we will also have our Christmas Eve service at 4 p.m. that evening. Uh, in case you're thinking, you know, I went to church in the morning, so I already heard the sermon. It's not going to be the same message. It's not going to be the same sermon. So you can come in the morning and come in the evening. So what's that? That's right. And we light candles on the Christmas Eve service. So that's right. Everyone lights candles, not just one person. So it's awesome. <laughs> So that is the announcements we have this morning. And again, it is a blessing to be with you all and be gathered together. And so if you would stand now, we will join in worship singing. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> oh, this mic on? I didn't hear anybody answer me. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. It's good to see you all here today. This is the first Sunday in December, so it's traditionally called Advent Sunday. So I thought I would um, change things up a little bit. I'm actually going to have the scripture readings here first, and then we're going to sing about what I read. So the scripture reading this morning is from Luke 2, 1 through 5. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph and Mary also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem.
Continuing with the, uh, today's scripture reading, we're in Luke 2, 6 through 7. So it was, while they were there, the days were completed for Mary to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And I want to ask any of the kids who want to come up here and sing, to sing with us up here and play with us. And you'll see the words up here on the screen. So that's great. You can sit on the bench if you want to. You can stand. It's just nice to have kids up here singing too. I think you guys might know this tune. Let me raise it up a little bit. Before we sing, I have to read the next scripture that talks about this. But you know what happened, Silas? Can you tell me? What happened next? A big truck gets in okay. there. The, um, then the shepherds came? The shepherds came after they were, the angels came to talk to the shepherds, remember? Let's read about it in Luke 2, 8 through 14. Now they were, in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you in this day, in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So it talks about it there. Do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy. So we're going to sing joy to the world. Take my capo off. This I can sing along with you a little best. bit. You ready? <laughs>
Luke 2, 15 through 18. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the sayings which were told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So the shepherds went out all over the mountains around Jerusalem and were telling everybody about the wonderful thing that had just happened. That's Don't kind of you want to do that song a little bit later? Mm -hmm. seated. Someone taller is going to get that down later. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see all of you. We have two scriptures this morning, so hang tight. We're going to start in Exodus 3, 9 through 11. Okay, so this is when Moses is standing um, in front of the burning bush and God is talking to him. And, and God says, And now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Our second scripture is found in Luke 30. Sorry, Luke 1, 30 through 38. And this is when Mary is visited by an angel. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never be will never end. How can this be, Mary, asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who has said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fall, will ever fail. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Okay, kids. What is this giant thing? A rubber band. You've seen them before, right? Okay, and it's quite stretchy. And we could see if I, no, I won't do that this morning. It could bean somebody in the eye. Maybe another, maybe outside later we could see how far we can make this guy fly. What would happen if it wouldn't stretch? Well, yeah, what would happen? We would not call it a rubber band. That's true. 
what would happen to it if it didn't stretch? As I'm pulling on it, it didn't stretch. It would what? It would break, right? So here's Moses, and he's standing in front of the burning bush, and God of the universe talks to him. He says, I have a special job for you to do. I want you to free my people. And Moses says, eh, are you sure? And God and he have a conversation. He's like, I'm not a good talker. Who am I supposed to tell people who you are? What if they won't believe me, right? And so Moses' thinking was not very what? Flexible, was not that flexible. And we do that too, right? We're like, I'm not good at art. I'm super shy. I can't do that job. I hate listening to my, or maybe not hate. Maybe that's not the right word. I would rather not listen and obey, right? So <laughs> sometimes our flex, thinking's not very flexible, right? And then contrast Moses' response to God's call is Mary, right? She's a young person, a young woman. And God calls her and says, hey, sends the angel. I've got a special job for you to do. And Mary's a bit, she just asks the question, how is this possible? Right? And then her answer to the call was what? Do you remember? What did she say? She says, okay, right? May this be... Lost my rubber band. Um, he just says, may this, be, may this happen as you will, or may this be as the Lord has said, right? So she says, okay, God, I'll go. She, doesn't, she just asks a question, a practical one, about how this is going to work. And then she says, okay, I'll go do that, right? So her thinking was very flexible about what God can do and what he's called her to do and what, she, what she's capable of, right? She's just a young girl. She's going to face quite a lot in her young life from her community and from her family because now as a young girl a young woman she's got to go tell her grown-ups um mom dad guess what <laughs> so that must have been a hard conversation but she was willing to do it because god asked her to and so we can be willing to do the things god asks us to do and be encouraged by mary's response but here's what good news guys guess what Moses didn't want to go because he said he wasn't a very good speaker. And so God sent him a helper, his brother Aaron, and he had compassion on him. So he understood that he was scared. God understands when we're scared to do the thing he asked us to do. But he'll help us. He'll help us do that thing. Mm. It's because we can have hope in him. So that brings me to my, the next thing. So truly, could you come on up here? I know. I didn't even talk to you. So here's our, today is the first um, Sunday of Advent. Okay, and so the first candle that we light is the hope candle, and we usually let a kid do it. They're excited because, you know, fire. <laughs> so we're going to light, go ahead and light the hope candle. Yeah. Can you press this button? And that's good. Yeah. This, this one. Uh -huh. Because Mary was given hope that she would birth the Messiah, and people have been waiting for hundreds and hundreds of years for the Messiah to come. And today is the first Sunday, perfect, of Advent. Thank you, Truly. We can have hope. Whoop, try again. Oh, that's all right. We're okay with those kinds of... Yeah, that's all right. Try again. We can be flexible in our thinking when it doesn't work out, right? So, um, this is our hope candle, and we have the hope of Jesus. So today is the first Sunday of Advent, right? And each of our candles represents something else. So today is the hope, the hope that we have of the promised Messiah, um, as we celebrate his birth and think about what that means to have the Savior of the world come into our lives. Thank you, Truly. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to um, do the work that you set before us and confess that sometimes our thinking is not very flexible, that sometimes we say no to you or ignore things you want us to do. So just ask you, Father God, to help us to be uh, open-hearted towards you and what you would call us to do. May our response look a little bit more like Mary's, who, who was just willing to do what you asked her to um, and was excited about that. Um, and when we have moments where we're more like Moses, which for me is a probably more than I would like to admit, I pray, thank you so much for your grace. And I can have hope in you. Thank you for this first Sunday in Advent. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. That hope extends so much further beyond just the birth of Christ. And that is what we also get to recognize and celebrate today with communion. Communion, of course, and the death and ultimately the resurrection of Christ would not have been possible without his birth. So they go hand in hand. And so it is that reminder that we have hope because God so loved us, the whole world, 
you and me and everyone so loved us that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And so during this season, Advent season, we do reflect on the coming of the Christ child. And we also have the opportunity with communion to reflect on what Jesus did for us through his life, his death, and his resurrection. So the night before Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this represents my body broken for you. So take, eat, in remembrance of me. So let's partake together. Likewise, Jesus took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this represents my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take drink in remembrance of me and proclaim what I have done until I come again. So let's partake together. Let's join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Children, you are dismissed to Children's Church. So for the month of December, I'm going to do a four-part series that is titled Christmas Cousins. And I will say one of the things that I so, and it's just one of the things, there are many things, but one of the things that I so love about the Word of God is that I can go back and read the same passage over and over and over again and it's like God's Spirit teaches me new things each time and so uh, today the sermon scripture comes from Luke chapter 1 verses 5 through 13 go ahead and turn there and just uh, hold your place there we'll get to that in a few minutes but I, I love this again because uh, for those who were here I preached on this particular passage about two years ago when we started our series on Luke. But if you were here two years ago for that, this is a completely different sermon. So uh, that's where God, as I looked at this and looked with a different thing, God and His Spirit just taught me so much new and more that I want to share with you. And so the title of today's sermon is his name shall be called John. Well, many of you, even if you are not a parent yourself, you know from others that are around you, even if you're a child, you know from your parents, there are no manuals provided to new moms and dads in the delivery room on how to perfectly raise the perfect child. And it isn't long until every new mother and new father realizes that they are in for the ride of their lives. 
I, I read this week of a mother who recalled the memory of when her three-year-old was putting on his shoes all by himself. And she noticed that he had put his shoes on the wrong feet. So she said, honey, your shoes are on the wrong feet. And he looked down for a moment, then up at her with a strange look and said, mommy, you cannot fool me. I know that these are my feet. <laughs> Well, for those who have become parents, when you became parents, life changed forever. Whether that was becoming a parent biologically, having a child yourself, whether it was adopting a child, whether it was becoming a step parent, whatever the case may be, you know that your life changed forever. And children think differently than parents do. Or sometimes it feels like children don't think at all. <laughs> Which does take some getting used to. But parenting is never quite the same as what people expect before actually becoming parents. Uh, another thing that you will grow to treasure as parents are the pictures that you take. Many of which you will be able to use to bribe your children later in life <laughs> when they will do anything to keep you from showing that picture to anyone who knows them, especially someone special to them. <laughs> Pictures are priceless and can tell a million different stories. Additionally, those pictures tend to become family favorites. So, for all of you who are parents out there, you are in for the ride of your life. And don't forget your camera. <laughs> and you need to Expect that many of the pictures will look different than you anticipated. When Malachi the prophet put down his quill, God put away the prophetic word. And for more than 400 years, the word from God was not heard. When God finally spoke again through his messenger Gabriel, two families' lives were turned upside down. One married woman who could not get pregnant would be told that she would be. And her unmarried cousin who should not be pregnant was told that she is about to be. The Christmas story actually focuses on one extended family and the lives of cousins, Elizabeth and Mary and their baby boys, John and and Jesus. Now, most people think that Gabriel's first message from God about the birth of a baby boy was to Mary, but it wasn't. The angel came first to the husband of Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. And this extended family was about to begin the ride of their lives. And some of the pictures in their family photo album were going to look far different than they could have ever imagined. Well, let's back up for a moment and start at the beginning. And so, if you're not there yet, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, as Luke, the doctor, delivers the news in his first chapter of not just one miraculous conception, but two of them. So look with me, starting in verses 5 and 6. Luke chapter 1. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Now, at the very outset, we are given the historical context of the Christmas story. This is taking place, it says, during the days of Herod the king. He was also known as Herod the Great, appointed king of Judea by the Roman Senate about 37 years before the birth of Christ. By the time these cousins, John and Jesus, are born, Herod was known as a brutal man. He had already ordered the murder of the Jewish high priest simply because the priest was more popular than, with the people than he was. He clung 
to his title with vicious power, the title King of the Jews. He considered this his claim and his alone, which is why less than two years after these events, he will order the execution of every little boy in and around Bethlehem because one of them had been identified by the visiting Persian dignitaries as the king of the Jews. And he was not going to have that. <laughs> no competition for him. <laughs> Herod was already 70 years old when these events took place. And before he died, he would have two of his sons murdered because he could not stand the thought of them taking his place. He's, he imprisoned his third son and then had him executed after his son attempted to escape from prison but failed. He was petty, insanely jealous, and brutal. But he had accomplished one thing especially that kept his ratings sky high and had given him immense favor with the people. He had expanded and lavishly refurbished the temple. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, tells us that this temple project involved 10,000 Jewish laborers under the direction of 100 priests. He wrote that the temple was refurbished with imported cedar and white marble. Much of the temple, including massive double front doors, was overlaid with plates of solid gold. Josephus wrote that the sun was no sooner up than it radiated so fiery a flash that people were compelled to look away, as if they were looking directly at the sun even. To approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain. Everything that was not overlaid with gold was of the purest white. And this was all designed by implication to fulfill what their last prophet had promised just before the darkness and the silence of God enveloped the land and the people. Malachi had prophesied that the brilliance of the sun would one day rise upon the nation and said in Malachi 4.2, the sun of righteousness would rise with healing in its wings. The people were waiting for and hoping for the sunrise of righteousness, of hope and healing. But for 400 years, it had only been darkness and despair and confusion and corruption. No wonder Zechariah says in his response to the birth of his son John, in Luke chapter 1, verse 78, the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness. Well, the darkness is beginning to lift and the sun is beginning to rise. But not for everyone. Herod the king would only deepen the darkness in his own heart. For him, the sun would never rise. And he is immediately contrasted with this godly couple that Luke introduces us to in verse 5. Now we're told that a priest named Zechariah was faithfully serving in the division of priests. And we know from history that there were around 10,000 priests serving at this time who lived in and around Jerusalem. They were divided into 24 groups. And each of the groups was assigned to work for one week periods twice a year. Luke informs us that Zechariah was under the division of Abijah. From these relatively insignificant comments, we're actually able to learn some significant things about this old priest. In fact, we are able to determine that Zechariah was not one of the elite members of the priesthood. The priests in his division didn't even live in Jerusalem. They were not among the well-connected families of priests. He was not uh, among the priestly aristocracy, you might say. Zechariah would have been referred to as an ordinary country priest, one of 8,000 who lived outside 
the city limits. We're also told in this verse that he was married to Elizabeth, a direct descendant of Aaron, who was Israel's first high priest. A priest who was married to the daughter of a priest was considered a distinct blessing. But for Zechariah, it was even doubly so because she had directly descended from Israel's high priestly family. And her son John, by the way, would act in many ways as a high priest should act before the people, calling them back to repentance, preparing their hearts to hear the voice of God. Well, Luke describes this couple with glowing terms in verse 6. Luke says, Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Now, they were not perfect, and, and we'll see that in a moment, but they were passionate about God and his ministry. And that's why the next phrase is so startling, at least to me it is, in verse 7. It says, But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren. Now, this might not seem like it, but this is shocking news. One might expect the next phrase to read, and they had 12 children, or they were exceedingly blessed and prospering, just as the God of Abraham and covenant had promised to his faithful ones. That's what many might expect to read, but that is not what scripture says. Instead, it says they had no children. Now, why that's important is it's important to understand the religious culture around them at that time. Because the religious culture around them at that time would have been unforgiving in their prognosis. Faithful believers could expect to participate in the Abrahamic covenant blessing of prosperity and fertility. A barren woman in the Old Testament covenant would cause people to assume that she had been abandoned by God's grace for some fault of her own. That's why Rachel, when she finally bears a son that she names Joseph, says in Genesis 30 that God had taken away her reproach. That's also why Elizabeth will say later in Luke chapter 1 verse 25... She says, God has taken away my disgrace. And by the time of Christ, the rabbis were teaching that several types of people were unable to enjoy close communion with God. And one of them was a Jewish man whose wife was unable to have any children. In fact, barrenness was considered valid grounds for divorce in that culture. So, who does God choose to communicate with? Well, God is going to turn everything upside down because the sun is about to rise. Now, I think it's important that we don't overlook the last phrase of verse 7 because Luke knows that we need to understand the extent of this miraculous conception of the cousin of Jesus. So Luke adds this footnote. They were both well along in years. Some translations read, they were well stricken in years. Which actually is a good translation simply because the Jews categorized old age with several different phrases. They believed the commencement of old age began at 65. So a 64 year old was not old, but at 65, they began to enter old age. At, at the age of 70, they were said to reach, and I quote, quarry-headed age. In other words, a 70-year-old person was now among the gray-haired and wise. After the age of 80, they were considered well-stricken in age. Well, Zachariah and Elizabeth are in their 80s. Their age-spotted hands would never hold a child of their own, or so they thought. 
By the time we are introduced to them, they were no longer praying for a child. They had stopped praying for a child decades ago. They were faithful to God and faithful to each other. They were not in sin. They were not hiding rebellion. They were not out of fellowship. And they had not abandoned their heritage or their faith. They were in the middle of God's will, even though God had never given them their greatest wish. Well, the name Zechariah means God remembers. The name Elizabeth means the promise of my God. <laughs> and I can only imagine how the enemy must have whispered many times to them, God remembers his promise? Oh, really? He evidently does not remember his promise on your behalf. And I can only imagine how they struggled and were discouraged by those lies. And I can't help but stop here for a moment and ask the question, what does it take for you and me to stop serving him, to stop trusting him, to believe the lie that God doesn't care about you, that his promises are for everyone else but you. And what I love about the rising sunshine of God's redemptive light is that God chooses an ordinary country priest, someone who really never made much of a contribution to the priesthood. In the eyes of his peers and his neighbors, he was now just an old man about to reach an age where he would not even be able to make the trip to Jerusalem to perform his duties. He was married, as I said, to a descendant of Aaron. But everyone believed that even though this couple was living a life worthy of respect and appreciation, they were obviously, according to the people around them, under some kind of divine disapproval and displeasure. They didn't know what it was, but obviously God was not blessing them with a child. <laughs> One remarkable thing to me is that Zechariah didn't resign. Elizabeth didn't say, you know what? Listen, God has not paid his fair share. Why bother? We've been living and serving God under this cloud of suspicion for 50 years. It's not been worth it. Let's just hang it all up. But that's not the response. And honestly, that's what I would have expected to hear them say at this point in time. Honestly, I don't know that I wouldn't be there saying that, you know, if I were in the same shoes. I would like to think not, but I don't know. But we do find instead that this priest from the country would gather his clothes and find someone to look after his homestead and his wife while Elizabeth packed his food, patched his robes, and prepared for a week of her own silence as her husband went off to serve a God who seemingly was not all that interested in them. But they stayed at it, serving and worshiping God. Only by now, at the age of 80, they had stopped praying for certain things, like children and grandchildren. I couldn't help but think of William Carey, the great missionary that I've talked about before here in India, who spent more than 20 years translating the Bible into several Indian dialects. His biographer recorded how one day his warehouse caught fire and literally burned to the ground. He lost his manuscripts, entire translations of several Bibles in production. The typesetting characters used in the presses had literally melted down into clumps of metal. <laughs> the next day was Sunday, and Carrie was supposed to preach. Well, he stood and said, My text for today is Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. He went on to say to his congregation that he was confident 
of two things. First, that God has the right to dispose according to his will as he pleases. And secondly, that our duty as believers is to acquiesce to his will. That did not mean that it was all roses and whistling songs for Carrie. In fact, he would write to a family member that this was a heavy blow. He wrote, and I quote, Oh, the providence of God is dark. There doesn't seem to be any light. It's dark. There isn't a sunrise in sight. It doesn't make sense. You can't figure it all out. Be still and know that he is God. And all of that is about to change so fast one can hardly believe it. Look at verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, in other words, he is in Jerusalem for his week of service. And then verses 9 and 10. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Now let me briefly describe what's happening here. Hundreds of priests had never had the lot land on their name. Thousands of priests over the years had never had the honor of entering the holy place, that inner sanctuary just outside the Holy of Holies, to burn incense before God. A symbol of prayer ascending to the very presence of God. This was the ultimate culmination of his priestly office. Zechariah would represent the entire nation in prayer before God. And here's how it happened. Zechariah would be able to choose two friends, two other priests who would accompany him into the holy place. Between the three of them, one of them would remove the remnants of the previous offering of showbread and then reverently back out of the holy place. Another would clean the golden altar of incense and remove the ashes from the previous coals. They would bring hot coals from the outer brazen altar where the animals had been sacrificed and place them on the grid of the golden altar. Then the second priest would also reverently back out of the holy place. Then at that moment, all of the priests and all of the people outside the temple would kneel and pray. Zechariah all alone, walked over to the golden altar of incense with his liquid frankincense. And, no doubt, with his heart racing and his hands quivering, he poured that costly liquid perfume over the glowing coals. He was immediately engulfed in billows of this sweet-smelling smoke. It was a symbol of the sweetness of prayers ascending to God. Implied, by the way, in the gift of frankincense given to Christ as a child by the Magi. That was a symbol of the coming sweet intercessory ministry of prayer on our behalf by Jesus Christ, our High Priest. How the heart of Zechariah must have thrilled at the pleasure of this unique ministry on behalf of the people. To a man who never seemed to be noticed, and certainly to a couple who seemed to have been overlooked by God, this was an incredible blessing and a confirmation of his life's work. But it wasn't about to end there either. As the smoke cleared, Zechariah suddenly realized he was not alone. Notice verses 11 and 12. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. That's the biblical way of saying he was totally freaked out. Yeah. Zechariah is in there alone with an angel who will later identify himself as Gabriel, the angel who had visited the prophet, 
prophet Daniel centuries earlier. And Gabriel said to Zechariah what angels tell human beings when they first encounter them. Verse 13, do not be afraid. There's been no word from God for centuries. No angel sightings for 400 years. Suddenly, daylight is coming. And then look what happened. Verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. Your prayer has been heard. Now, wait a second. This was not Zechariah's prayer, at least not now. He was in there praying for his nation, the coming Messiah, redemption, national holiness. He was more than 80 years old. He was not in there praying for a child. He had prayed that prayer some 50 years ago. He had offered that petition to God a million times 40 years ago. He and Elizabeth had cried together often, praying for a child 30 years ago. And they had finally stopped praying about that. Zechariah, God heard your prayer 50 years ago. He knew Elizabeth's feelings of disgrace 40 years ago. He knew all about your longing and your tears 30 years ago. And when you finally stopped praying about that, he knew when you stopped praying too. Gabriel is delivering this stunning revelation to this old priest and honestly to every single one of us. Listen, Zechariah, just because God never answered you does not mean he didn't hear you. He knew you wanted children and he knows that you cannot biologically have children now unless he performs some radical internal surgery and turns the clock back on both of you. But Zechariah, the sun is about to rise. You and Elizabeth are a part of the coming daylight of God's redemptive plan. Your physical inability is now the perfect platform for God's supernatural ability. Can you imagine these family pictures? 80-year-old Elizabeth and Zechariah shopping for baby clothes? <laughs> this was not exactly what they had expected. And their son was to be named John, which means the grace of God. And just yesterday, all the more this that I wrote <laughs> kind of came to a full picture for me because um, I was down uh, with the girls at the basketball tournament. And the girls were in the locker room and uh, I needed to get Miley a bottle of water. And so I asked one of the women if she would take the bottle of water in and give it. My daughter's name was Miley. And so uh, I didn't know this until Miley shared this with me later. But um, she went in and asked if there was a Miley there. And Miley you know, said, yes, I'm Miley. Uh, apparently the woman handed her and said, uh, your grandpa wants you to have a bottle of water. <laughs> So, you know, <coughs> makes me feel like my family pictures are not all, all, all that I expect either. But that's the incredible way that God works in our lives. We have expectations. We have plans. We, we have this idea that this is what our life's going to look like. This is what God's going to do in our life. This is where we're headed. And when we're open and we say, God, here I am, I'm your servant. There are many times that God says, oh, I heard your prayers. I heard your prayers 50 years ago and 40 years ago and 30 years ago. And I'm going to be answering your prayers in a way that you never imagined, that you never expected. That you may have walked for years thinking, God didn't hear my prayers or God didn't answer my prayers. But God is hearing our prayers. God is answering our prayers. And even though that answer sometimes is no, sometimes is wait and wait and wait.
right? Sometimes that answer comes in a way that we didn't see, we didn't expect. John would become a daily reminder to them that God's grace had indeed been sufficient to help them persevere through the darkness of their own nighttime when the voice of God had been silent. And God's grace would be sufficient to help them enter the challenging days of parenthood, one day at a time, one snapshot at a time, one challenge at a time. And if you put their three names together, you actually have this statement. God remembered his promise and his grace was just enough. Oh, by the way, no one, no one will be able to miss the fact that the Messiah and the Messiah's forerunner, these cousins, Jesus and John, are both in their own unique way, nothing less than miraculous conceptions. And we have so much more to learn from these cousins. Amen. If you will stand, we will have our closing worship song and then our benediction. Closing song, we're going to sing, O Come All You Faithful. receive today's benediction which comes from Romans chapter 11 verses 33 and 36. Oh the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever.